it's plausible that there could be rejection, just like an organ transplant can be rejected, right? That the immune system can recognize it as foreign and, and attack it. Um, there's a lot of tests available in the research environment for this. Most of the commercially available tests aren't really proving out to be clinically useful, although they are still used. There's really not a lot of useful testing beyond what we talked about this morning for antibodies, okay, that have strong scientific evidence. Some of the controversial testing that's out there includes these, which I'm not going to run through. I don't run them, you know, um, but these are some of the things that I found in literature that are in the research environment um, that are tested. But some of the things you can look at are the antibodies to phospholipids and nuclear antigens. This is your ANAs, antiphospholipid antibody, which we'll talk more in depth. Your thyroid antibodies, um, and then single-stranded, double-stranded DNA antibodies. These have all been evaluated. The research on these are not, on some of these, ANAs, and some of the DNA and um, single-stranded, double-stranded DNA antibodies, those have research, but it's kind of conflicting. But I still use them in practice. But just be cautious when you order these massive panels um, to understand that they can be expensive, they're not proven, quote unquote proven in literature, and you wanna make sure they're not misleading, okay? So let's talk about antiphospholipid antibody syndrome. This one really is not controversial, it's widely accepted, readily diagnosed, and it's very effectively treated, thankfully. Um, it's worthwhile to test for APS in early and later pregnancy losses for when you have recurrent loss. In early pregnancy, antiphospholipid antibody syndrome can affect implantation because this ends up causing issues with blood clotting, right? So in the early time, remember when I talked about that syncytiotrophoblast breaking into the myometrium? There's a lot of initial blood um, vessels that have to be formed and they're tiny because this little embryo is tiny, right? And so it can affect the blood flow early on through just micro clots, like micro thrombi, that prevent proper implantation. Also, later in pregnancy, it can cause bigger issues with blood clotting that can lead to like substantial clots that will affect blood flow to the fetus. Okay, so you would think about this in both early and late. So the diagnostic criteria for testing is three or more spontaneous losses before 10 weeks gestation. After you've ruled out an anatomical issue, a hormonal abnormality, or chromosomal abnormalities, okay? I test sooner than that. It's a lot to go through, you know, when this testing is pretty straightforward. Also, if you have the loss of one fetus, like when you have a pregnancy later than 10 weeks, a single loss warrants this workup. Or if you have a history of a premature birth of a morphologically normal neonate, so a preemie before 34 weeks, um, due to preeclampsia or placental insufficiency, this should be tested for any subsequent pregnancy. Okay. So the tests that you would run <clears throat> include lupus anticoagulant, anticardiolipin IgG or IgM, anti-beta-2 glycoprotein 1, those are like the three major ones. And you can just order them as a panel on most labs now. Also, there's some controversial testing that's been added in, including IgG or IgM, anti A5, anti-factor 12, antiprothrombin, and IgA APLS. Okay. Anti-nuclear antibody screening is not recommended as part of this workup. You might choose to add it based on what we talked about this morning, because remember, women with elevated ANA titers can have issues with fertility, but it's not part of the antiphospholipid antibody syndrome workup. Okay. So the clinical criteria for diagnosis includes the history I just described that would warrant workup and also vascular thrombosis. Okay. So you might suspect this even more. You want to suspect a vascular issue in women who maybe they had um, a blood clot post-surgically. Right? They have a history of blood clotting or a strong family history of blood clotting. Um, you can see the lab criteria are listed here, you know, basically positive antibodies, the antibodies I just listed. And the thing about testing is that to, in order to truly diagnose, it has to be tested positive on two separate occasions at least 12 weeks apart. That's terrible. I like really dislike this piece of the criteria for evaluating this condition because if you have a woman who's had sequential losses, 
and you, they test positive for antiphospholipid antibody syndrome, what are you going to be like, okay, go home and three months later, come back and I'll retest you. And then once we get a positive on a second time, maybe we'll treat, right? So no one wants to wait three months. Do any of your patients want to wait three extra months? Mine don't. You know? So you know, this is something that I think a lot of clinicians I'm seeing are treating. And I would say, well, I don't treat this solo myself. I treat it in partnership with a reproductive endo or a reproductive you know, hematologist um, because it typically will require medication management pretty tightly. We'll talk about that. Um, but a lot of clinicians are treating on one positive test not necessarily waiting for a second, because that's a lot to ask, particularly if you're working with patients that are in their late 30s or early 40s, where every single cycle can count because hormonal change can happen so abruptly. So, you know, I'm seeing treatment come in a lot sooner. Here's my chart for you um, of just some of the testing on the immunology side um, that you might consider. So those that are proven, which are part of the antiphospholipid antibody syndrome workup, those that are promising and those that can be potentially misleading or harmful. Okay. So if a woman tests positive for immune-mediated recurrent pregnancy loss, some of the treatments that have been done in the past or are still used today, steroids, not as well justified, but I still see them used. Do you guys see prednisone prescribed? Yeah. Um, I see it prescribed often. Sometimes it works. Sometimes for my patients, they are able to get pregnant. I think this is turned to, typically this is a prednisone prescription, and I see it turned to more when there's lack of a clear answer, but there's, you know, it's, it's like a trial, really just kind of a, a trial for it. Um, but there is an increased risk of gestational hypertension and gestational diabetes when prednisone is used to help facilitate um, implantation. So again, this might be where you think about licorice co-administered for a short course. Licorice I would not necessarily give during pregnancy, but I think for a short course co-administered with the progesterone may help to mitigate some of the side effects there. There's also immune globulin therapies available, but primarily what you're going to see is patients on heparin or aspirin. So a lot of providers make the recommendation for anyone with a loss to get on a baby aspirin once a day. I don't think that's a terrible recommendation. You know, it's not natural, it's not natural, you know, although it is white willow bark you could potentially use instead if you wanted to stick with something plant-based, but um, it can be helpful, aspirin as a, basically as a blood thinner. Um, baby, so baby aspirin is given very, very commonly whether or not women are diagnosed with antiphospholipid antibody syndrome, um, it's commonly prescribed anyway. But the combination of heparin, aspirin, and a woman who does have antiphospholipid antibody syndrome is usually the prescription. So um, when you add heparin, <clears throat> you can get some additional benefit there to prevent the blood clotting. Um, and the combination of the two actually seems to outperform, um, well, certainly aspirin alone. But even the heparin alone, I believe. One thought about why is it's proposed that one part of the mechanism of antiphospholipid antibody syndrome is that it ends up restricting the endothelium's ability to produce nitric oxide. So um, when we think about clotting or lack of blood flow, um, there's kind of two pieces. If there's a clot, the clot can get stuck, you know, like a clogged drain. You know, that's kind of how we think about it crudely. Uh, but there can be a lot of other pieces that go on board that can lead to clotting. And we see most of this research coming out of cardiovascular disease, of course, because of heart, you know, heart attacks and stroke are related to clotting. But part of it is this like lowering of nitric oxide. And nitric oxide is a compound that's responsible for helping keep blood vessels open, which is why like nitric oxide enhancing agents are used for things like erectile dysfunction as well, because they help to increase blood flow generally, including to the penis and to the heart and to the brain and to the uterus in this case. You want a lot of nitric oxide around. Um, so that's one of the reasons why they believe aspirin might help is you get a slight increase actually in nitric oxide with its use. It's not just a clotting inhibitor. Okay. The other things that have been shown to increase nitric oxide is, are beets. So that would be something that you could turn to instead nutritionally is, you know, or in addition, just to have your patients do beet juice consuming a lot of beets, or there are supplements out there where they're like basically beet extracts. Okay. Um, <clears throat> this is just one example study in women with elevated ANA. 
This is even when they had low concentrations of ANAs, even though the data says they're not important. When they gave them prednisone and aspirin, they had improved embryo quality and increased odds of implantation. Okay, so kind of interesting. You know, we're seeing that these might even have an impact when there's not a diagnosable um, antiphospholipid antibody syndrome. I also like fish oil. Fish oil um, has been demonstrated to produce the same positive pregnancy outcomes as low-dose aspirin in one small prospective 30-patient trial. Um, the nice thing about fish oil is there's like not really negative side effects other than burping. You know, we can handle that, right? We can handle burping. Okay, anti-sperm antibodies, it's unclear how most women don't produce these. We talked about them earlier. Um, they can affect sperm transport and motility. They can cause agglutination. It can cause problems with fertilization. Um, some of the testing, they can be testing for IgM, IgA, and IgG antibodies. IgM are confined to serum and they're not clinically relevant. They can't interact with sperm, so those aren't tested as frequently. And I mentioned the treatments, steroids, sperm washing, and IUI. Okay. Um, with naturopathic treatment, I mentioned, you know, thinking about using condoms, timing the attempt so you're not having as much intercourse or exposure, um, except at the time of conception. And we've talked all about the autoimmunity approaches that we take too. Just as a reminder of those, or for anyone that wasn't in this morning's lecture, the first part of it, some of the things I think about are food allergy testing and an elimination diet, and some of my favorite treatments, omega-3s, like that paleo-mediterranean diet, Addressing stress is very important. Some of my favorite immune modulating botanicals are listed here. Um, one of the ones I find trouble, can you guys get Albizia here in Canada? I don't know. It's tough to find in the US, but when I was in Australia, it was really common and it's a fantastic botanical for um, autoimmunity or high inflammation. I'm still looking for it. I don't get to use it in practice now because I can't find it commercially. I can't hear you, but you can tell me after. It's okay. Um, <laughs> um, Eric Yarnell is one of my favorite herbal professors in the U.S., and I just wanted to share his kind of chronic autoimmunity protocol so, or treatment. So he bases the doses on one teaspoon three times a day for three months. Um, and so he includes botanicals that are supportive to liver, kidneys, you know, for processing, um, just generally those support. Musculoskeletal or lung, you might add glyceriza if those are organs are targeted. And then some of the botanicals that he might include generally, which you'll see a lot of um, adrenal botanicals on here. So don't forget about the impact that stress has. Have you guys ever read the book, Why Zebras Don't Get Ulcers? One of my favorites. It's like remarkable, and I've actually reread it two or three times. Every time I like, you know, get stressed and need a slap in the face about why I need to calm down, um, you know, that's a great a great book that talks about the physiological effects of elevated stress hormones in the body. But a lot of the adrenal management, um, you can see here the Eleutherococcus, Panax ginseng, Oplopanax, mushrooms. We love mushrooms, astragalus, etc. Uh, some of the other botanical inflammation modulators you can think about too. This is again with the immunological approaches. We've talked about a lot of these, glyceriza, boswellia, um, ginger, curcumin, et cetera. Okay. So that's the inflammation piece. Let's talk briefly about thrombophilias. So thrombophilias are... I see